All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kelly, and I'm going to be your host for today. In today's webinar, we're going to be taking a look at designing accurate 5G networks in IV Wave design. And we're going to do that by exploring the use case of a 5G design done at the Bossa Nova Mall in Brazil um, by QMC Telecom. Today's speaker will be our Senior Director of Research and what I call our internal 5G guru, Vladan Javramovic. Um, and just before I hand it over to Vladan to do the speaking, I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items with you. We are recording uh, today's webinar and you will receive a link by email in your inbox. Um, if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask them and please do so by utilizing the GoToWebinar questions box that you should see on your screen. And we don't have any polls today, so I won't go over that last item with you. So at this point, um, I am going to hand it over to Vladan so we can dive into the webinar. Vladan, over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Before we start, uh, there are a few slides about our company, IWR Solutions, for those of you that uh, joined us for the first time. Um, this is who we are and this is what we have done. Um, we keep the world connected. We have 19 plus years of uh, inbuilding uh, wireless uh, experience in this space. We offer connected solutions for indoor and outdoor, wireless and wireline. We have uh, over 1,150 customers in 100 countries, and our customer approval rating is 95%. Uh, thousands of wireless networks have been designed worldwide using our uh, software, and we have almost 3,500 certified professionals worldwide. Uh, in other words, we offer simple and innovative software solutions that accelerate the network project lifecycle and help our customers deliver flawless connectivity. The, these are some of our customers. Um, there, is, there are a lot of them, and what you can see is that there are OEMs there, like Ericsson and Nokia. Uh, there are um, there are wireless operators like AT&T and Bell and uh, T-Mobile and Verizon. And there are system integrators there, like, uh, um, like for example, the uh, Black Box and Crown Castle. So we have the whole industry, in-building industry covered there, the whole ecosystem. And uh, we offer several different uh, products. For in-building, we have our flagship uh, software, IBWA Design Enterprise, but we also offer IBWA Mobile Planner and Mobile Survey. And we are covering uh, all the licensed uh, um, uh, spectrums for 3G, 4G, 5G, uh, but also for Wi-Fi and CBRS and public sa safety. For outdoor design, our product is IBWA Reach and is used for campus design. For Wi-Fi, we have IBWA Wi-Fi and IBWA Wi-Fi Mobile. For public safety, we have IBWA Public Safety. For fiber, we have FiberPass. And for collaboration, we have IBWA Unity for site management. Having said that, our agenda today is as follows. We're going to talk about the venue description where the 5G trial network was set up. We're going to talk a bit about 5G NR trial network. Then we will look into field data that was collected from that 5G trial network and the post-processing of that data. And finally, we will talk about prediction accuracy. Uh, what is the accuracy level of our tool with respect to what was uh, collected in the field. Our venue, that is going to be the topic of, uh, of uh, this uh, webinar, is uh, uh, the Bosta Nova Mall in Rio de Janeiro. And at that mall, Brazilian system integrator QMC have deployed in their network. They have deployed uh, commercial 4G LTE network there, but uh, they also used that uh, mall to set up a trial 5G network. This mall is a seven level structure with 1,600, 16,000 square feet 
and 5 million annual visitors. That mall is located in, near the airport, International Airport in Rio de Janeiro, and there is also a hotel um, next to it. And um, what I wanted to show you now, I'm going to be switching between um, this presentation and uh, IB Wave Design software. What I want to show you is how it uh, looks like that, um, that mall modeled in uh, our software tool. This is a 3D view of, uh, of, of the mall, okay? All the seven levels. Okay, now going back to our uh, presentation. Um, the trial network, consists of five irradiation points and it operates at uh, 3.5 uh, gigahertz. Of those five antennas, we had three that are located at the food court and uh, we have one that is located on a different level. The food court is on a mezzanine level. <clears throat> on the street level, we have two antennas. One is in Uber lounge and one is in hotel lobby. So those at the uh, food court, they are presented here. The snapshot was taken by QMC uh, of those antenna as deployed in the food court. And this is how it looks as it modeled in IB Wave design. I'm to switch again to our software to show you this is the food court in the software and these are those three antennas i'm now going to zoom in a little bit so you can see them those three uh, antennas are the uh, 5g radiation points and now i'm going to show you how it looks like on 3D plan. So these are, this is the food court, and those are the uh, omnidirectional 5G NR antennas or radiation points. So you see how they are modeled. What you see here are also directional antennas, and those directional antennas are for 4G network. So 4G network already has been deployed, and 5GNR is something that they have tested at this mall. So this is mezzanine level, but on the ground level, we have two more antennas. Here is the one at the hotel, and here one is the Uber lounge. I'm going to now zoom in on that as well. And this is Uber Lounge, and this one is at the entrance to the hotel. As for the uh, um, 5G trial network, even though that they had um, those five antennas there spread throughout the network, um, the question then is where was the operator signal source? Operator signal source was at a head end location right there at the last level, at the roof level. And there we had the uh, signal source that was uh, connected to point of interface and then from POI to master at the head end. And from there we have conversion from RF to optical to individual antennas, five antennas that were spread throughout the mall, three at the food court and the other two at the ground level, one at uh, the Uber lounge and the other one as entrance to the hotel. Of those five antennas, uh, QMC has uh, given us access to data that was collected uh, from one antenna in the food court. If you remember, there were three. I have deleted them, uh, those other two from here, so it doesn't con confuse us. So what I'm showing is the middle of the three antennas at the food court, 
where I um, but they have collected the data um, from that antenna, and that was uh, SSRSRP uh, data uh, throughout. And the data was collected using using a four by four smartphone. I don't think it was an Android phone. And uh, <clears throat> so what you can see there is that if we take a look at the data closely, typically for this um, SSR SRP coverages, if your signal is greater than a uh, neg 95 dBm. So from that antenna, what we see is a coverage that basically goes roughly from this end to this end. Okay, everything outside of that is, should be in a well-designed network already in the uh, target area of another antenna. So um, when they go below 95, hopefully another antenna is going to take over. Uh, with that coverage. But uh, what QMC have done is they um, ran an extensive route and you see that uh, the signal gets very low at the edge, this edge of the coverage and there as well. Right. So those typically would not uh, play a major role um, in coverage or as an interference in the network, those edges. So, um, for field data analysis, if we look into um, what we have, as I said, a bit of it is uh, really low signal, which is SSR SRP less than NEG110. And I wanted to give you a visual as to what that area that is less than NEG110 dBm is. And those are shown here in a dark blue. Um, so this area is less than NEG 110 mostly. There are some points that are um, higher than NEG 110, but there are a few of them. And this area here where we have NEG 110. So um, for the purpose of data analysis, we took that out. Um, so why? Well, as I said, target is NEG 95. But then, you know, there is a certain uh, range below NEG95 where you still have to take into account the non-serving signal because it may show up as interference depending on your scheduler. Um, so, but eventually your signal becomes so low, then it doesn't really matter as interfering signal either. And that is about 15 dB below the, the, low, the lowest threshold for coverage. So 15 dB below of NEG95 would be NEG110. So that is the reason why we decided to take it out. Um, the second reason why we decided to take it out is because we wanted to calibrate this data to improve on coverage accuracy. Now, if you go and calibrate the data that uh, the coverage that really doesn't matter, which is minus from minus 110 to minus 120, what you are doing is you are making your prediction work well, both in that uh, uh, equally in that region that doesn't matter, which is from neg minus 120 to neg minus 110 as well as other regions that do matter, right? <clears throat> and because you can't really do all things at once, your overall accuracy will suffer because you are trying to, um, to improve your coverage everywhere, and even in the area where it doesn't matter. So that's why we cut this, uh, um, this low-level signal, um, because if we have less of a range, to um, fit our our prediction to, then the more successful we are going to be. Um, there is also another important point in field data analysis. Um, we have used 4x4 MIMO here, and uh, that really means that our antenna gain is in a 6 to 8 dB range, because we 4x4 MIMO is four antenna array. And there, if you know about antenna array theory, then the increase of a gain 
in antenna array is 10 logarithm the number of antennas plus individual antenna gain. So 10 logarithm of uh, 4 is equal to 6. And the question is, what is the individual antenna gain in that antenna array? So <clears throat> we have seen some reports and uh, from from antenna manufacturers at smartphones. Well, actually, the smartphone OEMs themselves, when they talk about uh, in the uh, about this antenna, uh, the four five G antenna gain, they talk about six to eight dB range which means that individual antennas that comprise antenna array at smartphones are between 0 and 2 dB. So the total antenna gain should be between 6 and 8 dB. So the question is, how do we exclude this low SSRSRP from the analysis? Um, the way we do that in our tool, and I'm going to switch in a second to show, is that we uh, define this pink area that you see here as uh, the prediction area, right? So you can actually make this as a, as a, uh, as a shape of any kind you want. And here I made it as a shape as to exclude this area right here, where the signal was between neg 110 and 120, but also to exclude this area when I showed you that was less than 110. So this is a prediction area, and it focuses on what is inside this shape, including this area as well. So <clears throat> I'm setting the prediction area where SSR SRP is greater than minus 110 dBF. All right, so this is how it looks like when we overlay um, one over the other. And uh, my, um, uh, my legends, as you can see, they show the same range for predicted SSR SRP. This is the legend to the left. And for data, uh, which is SSR SRP to the right. Okay. So because you have... <clears throat> the same legend, the same ranges, and the same color, we can do one-to-one -one observation as to what we are seeing here, right? So what we are seeing here is that uh, my data that I have collected is a little bit stronger than my prediction in this area, at the edge area, right? So I am a little bit conservative when I am doing the prediction of uh, this this 5G on air, uh, NR antenna coverage. In the main area right here, it is pretty good because you see hot area uh, right there when it should be hot, and then it goes green a little bit further away. And uh, when we get away from the main coverage area, you see that both our prediction and the data that uh, they have collected uh, go uh, dark very quickly. Okay, so from that standpoint is, it looks like they match up pretty evenly, okay, when you overlay um, the data on top of uh, each other. And uh, so <clears throat> that, is, that is encouraging. But uh, the question is, what is the prediction accuracy? And uh, <clears throat> we have, and I'm going to demonstrate that in a minute, uh, we have a report that would uh, compare the measured and predicted data. And uh, in that report, when we looked into this, uh, um, th this, this case of what they call non-calibrated um, prediction uh, algorithm, the difference of measured and predicted SSR SRP, the mean error was uh, less than 2 dB. The absolute mean error, which is where we actually discard the sign of the difference and just take the absolute value, is about 4.5 dB. 
and the standard deviation is almost six. Now, if I go back to this prediction, I want to point something out. When we start comparing the um, measured and predicted values, we do that point by point, right? So what algorithm does, it starts looking into how many points you have, how many points you have discarded. In this case, we have discarded these points or those points. And then for the remaining of the points, what it does, it takes the value in a pixel where the measurement is taken and compares that to the value from the same pixel where prediction is done. So what it really means, if I have, for example, I don't know, 400 measured points here, I'm going to have 400 points where the delta between uh, measured uh, SSRSRP and predicted SSRSRP is taken. What it really means is that there are vast areas where we do have prediction, but we don't have measurements, and those areas are not taken into account. For example, right here, I have no measurement, so I cannot really do comparison as to you know what is the difference between the predicted and measured things. It, it really applies to this area or that area or that area. Essentially, where I can, make evaluation of how accurate my tool is, is this corridor where the data is taken, okay? So everything else there is just a visual, you know, as to what is happening in the rest of, of, the, of the floor plan, but it doesn't really affect the uh, final result, right? So the final result is only affected by the uh, data points taken during the measurements, which means only the area where they traveled on foot is important for the analysis. So what you are seeing here is really a, a judgment of how my, how my tool did at points where the data was taken and in areas where the person who did the measurements uh, uh, conducted the measurements. Area that they did not access is the area where we don't have any data, okay. which is neither good or bad. Those are just limitations that you will see always when somebody talks about how well you know my tool has done um, in field. So this is what we have uh, what we call uncalibrated uh, um, prediction, and then the what we have also is a module that will do calibration based on um, the field data. And this after calibration, our accuracy, um, I would say, has improved because the absolute mean error is actually lower and standard deviation is lower a bit as well. The mean error has increased, that much is true, but um, what what I find more important is that standard deviation has tightened up. Okay, so that 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 is good. You you do want your standard deviation to go down as much as possible, and uh, absolute mean error uh, reduction is also is also a very good sign. Um, so the question now is, what is a good value for standard deviation and absolute mean error? What we have seen in uh, in building networks typically. Um, the absolute mean error will go from about 3 to 6 dB range, and standard deviation as well will go from 3 to 6. Um, that is for non-calibrated, it is the higher end of that range, and for calibrated, it is a lower end of that range. But those are the values that we have seen um, for in-building networks, it's typical, you know, for our for our tool. Now, speaking of our tool, I want to go here to show you a few things that I have mentioned in our in the talk. For example, I promised to show you the um, uh, prediction area, and this is um, how it is set up, as you see. Those are individual points that are used to draw this 
surface where I am going to run out of the prediction. Um, here, as you see it, is some of it is inside and some of it is outside of uh, the prediction area. And uh, finally, the prediction of the horizontal surface is included there. Um, so when I said uh, I can do a report of prediction versus measured data, it is right here. So when I click on it, I have several options. These are my uh, <clears throat> uh, my possible um, comparisons that I can do. And this is a default prediction, which I called non-calibrated. And this is SSR SRP data that I see here on this floor. So when I say generate, it will give me a report. And these are the values that you have seen on my last slide when I told you that standard deviation is close to six and the absolute mean error is about 4.5. Now, <clears throat> this expected uh, values in dBs are shown here and you can set it up here uh, whether you want to uh, this expected value, um, whether your value that showed up in the report is less than expected or more than expected. If it is less than expected, then you say it's passed. And if it is more than accepted, you, you say it has failed. But those are something that you can set up yourself. Now, valid point and discarded points, I talked about that a little bit. It is uh, where your points are with respect to your prediction um, uh, surface, right? Because I have left some out. Um, they are counted as uh, discarded points and are not being used in this uh, uh, analysis. Um, so this is what uh, we did. This is for um, uncalibrated prediction, and you can do the same thing for calibrated um, um, calibrated prediction. And there, as I have pointed out in the report, you see that your standard deviation is now a bit less than before, more than 2 dB. Um, it's about dB less for absolute mean error, but my mean error has increased a little bit. And all three of those uh, key performance indicators are less than expected value, and that's that's all great. So with that, I think I have shown um, everything that I wanted here for the demo and uh, for this presentation presentation and I'm going to turn this over to Kelly to see if we have any questions. Hey Ladan, thanks so much. Um, we definitely do have some questions here for you so let's start to go through them uh, and see what we can get through. So um, I'll just go in order. Could you please mention if 5G NR Omni antenna is 2x2 two two or uh, say so? Okay, I can take a look. What they had. So this is the antenna that they have uh, supports eight bands with integrated antennas and let me see what they have. The antenna is Sunwave solution and mod model is N2RU I cover. So you can look up the the technical info uh, from the manufacturer. Okay, thanks, Solan. Um Another question here: When collecting scanner data for 5G networks, what KPI or RSRP parameters the correct one to verify coverage? SSS, SSB, or PSS? SSS. SSS uh, was uh, was used for this for this particular um, analysis. Okay. So uh, another question here: What are realistic rank three, rank four indicator statistics? Uh huh. Okay. I do not have uh, that data from uh, the trial. 
we were given the data for SSS, RSRP, uh, but we were not given the data for for uh, for different ranks. But the okay. question here here is how well uh, four by four MIMO works. That that really is is the question, you know. Um, and I, I assume that implication is is it worth it to have four by four MIMO? Um, that if I say something, it would be my opinion, but the question was um, really have we seen uh, that data from the trial? And the answer is no, we have not. Okay, thank you. Is the accuracy achieved with default link budget components available in ID Wave? The accuracy is what I have, uh, yes, uh, from, the, from our database and using uh, the values for uh, um, for materials, okay? All default is what you see here in the first uh, screenshot of, uh, of uh, predicted measured minus predicted SSR, SRP, uh, uh, mean error, absolute mean error, standard deviation. Yes, so that, that basically is all default IB wave, and this is calibrated. Okay. Um, so that leads to another question that just came in here, which is how how did you calibrate or how was it calibrated? If you could clarify that. Yeah, I've, I've taken uh, the data that was field data. You basically take some data for calibration and the other, uh, uh, the rest of it for verification. And this is typically what you should uh, use in calibration uh, process. Take some data for calibration and then use the rest for verification. Okay, thank you. What is the real frequency of the measurements from the UE? <clears throat> um, it was it was at 3.5 gigahertz. I, if you are asking me uh, which 100 megahertz um, uh, sub-channel, I mean, which sub-channel was used, I don't know that. I just know it was 100 megahertz and it was at 3.5 gigahertz. Okay. Um, which values are used for noise figure, body loss, and fast fading margin? Right. Let's take a look. Actually, I'll do this. There they are. Noise figure was uh, six, and then again eight. Body loss three. Fast fading margin margin zero. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Did you do the SNR predictions versus reality? No, no. They we did not get that data. Uh, can you measure and predict data throughput? I can. We, we can predict maximum, yeah. maximum achievable data rate, but we were not really given the data throughput um, data. Okay. Uh, what is the recommended SD for indoor coverage? SD. I was hoping you'd know that. <laughs> I I don't know what okay. SD is. Okay. Okay, so if whoever adds, uh, asked that could clarify that, um, we can ask it again here. What was the total bandwidth, uh, 40, 100 megahertz, and did you split into multiple channels? No, it was it was one megahertz. We, it was not split into into multiple channels. It was one megahertz uh, uh, channel that they uh, ran the transmission at. Okay. So a question here around the predicted versus the measured reports. Um, the question is, was there really a difference in the two reports on the number of the discarded points? And if yeah, so I, saw, I, I, I saw that as I was uh, as I was presenting. Um, it's uh, it shouldn't be. It should be the same. I don't know why we are seeing a, a slight difference there. But uh, to me, those discarded points are the ones that are outside of this uh, area for prediction and as you see that has not changed and i'm not quite sure why we had a slight uh, difference there okay 
Um, since this is N78, how do you account for rank index four? For what index? It says since this is N78, mm -hmm. how do you or do you account for rank index four? I'll have uh, to get back to you on that. If you can please note uh, the person who asked and I will reply by email. Okay. Um, another question on how to calibrate the model. Um, are the wall materials in Ivy Wave updated with the 5G um, transmission loss information? Yeah, yeah. The question is, um, did we update that for frequencies that are now in use uh, for 5G. So the frequencies that are in use for 5G now typically are 3.5 gigahertz, where before we were using something lower, like 2.1, 2.6 gigahertz, now it's 3.5. And uh, we have seen that in some uh, places it will go higher than uh, 3.5, like uh, IoT in Germany would go higher than that, IoT in China, there will be something between 3.5 and 5. All those frequencies have been updated, um, those sub-6 gigahertz, but we also updated, we, I wouldn't say update because it, we, we never had them in the first place, the ones at millimeter wave. Um, it is in our database as well. So what you see here is a default that we had um, um, in our tool that uh, encompasses 3.5 gigahertz wall materials. Okay, thank you. So there's a couple of questions coming in, Vladan, around the calibration again. I think um, one is, can you please show what changes you did before and after calibration values to clarify? And another couple of questions on how you calibrated the model. Maybe you could just go over that one more time. Okay, uh, the way uh, how you calibrate model, we have that explained in our in our training session. I, I really didn't plan to give you a tutorial on how to uh, do that, but basically we have a calibration model where you can um, have, you know, you can select the antenna that was used for uh, data collection and you can select the data that was uh, collected and then you are going to do calibration which will spit out the uh, different propagation coefficients gamma 1, gamma 2 and gamma 3 and also it will give you the changes in the wall penetration loss. Now what you will do when it is done you will name that calibration um, that was just performed, you just give it some name, and then you can go and change the that particular antenna propagation from default to that specific name of, uh, of the calibration that you just did. And then, so next time when you run the prediction, that prediction will be run on a non-default uh, calibrated uh, um, coefficients. It is really outside of the scope of this webinar and I have not prepared an example as to how to do the calibration and it will take another 10 minutes to go over it in detail so that's why I, I did not, I'm kind of shining away from going into details of yeah. our calibration. It makes sense Lena, and I think just an, um, a, an explanation like you just said is, is great yeah. so thank you. Um, so one question here, if you uh, remove objects in the room or add people on the floor, would you expect your prediction to be very different um, for 5G? Well, objects in, in, in rooms, yes, of course, because um, what you have is a change in our propagation environment, right? Um, our tool is really a ray tracing tool which takes into account what objects you have in a room and uh, those objects, the signal can either penetrate to them, it can reflect from them, or it can diffract from them, right? Um, but in any case, those would be what we call non-line of sight propagation environment. And that non-line of sight propagation environment in, in, uh, really introduces loss. 
and one and it is very specific loss which means i know where the object is and i know that behind that object the signal is going to be less than what it would have been if i did not have an object but it is localized it is localized to vicinity of that object um, and so when you remove it obviously it's going to remove all those losses because the object was there and the signal goes up now as for for what people um so you saw the body loss um we don't know where the people are okay that is that is the the case with uh, this particular propagation um algorithm and then so i have to assume that in every pixel there exists a person and i'm not assuming it from the standpoint of capacity I'm not saying in every pixel i'm going to have a person that is going to require i don't know uh 50 uh, megabyte of data every hour i'm not saying that what i'm saying is in every pixel i have to account to a body loss that may or may not exist based on where the person is okay so in every pixel, I am assigning a certain body loss, you know, three, four, five, six dB, maybe even more, depending on the frequency. And uh, in every pixel, I have to make a decision whether there is an object in that pixel or not, right? So those two are going to affect a uh, signal value in that pixel, signal level, actually, in that pixel. Okay, thanks, Sladan. Um, how does IB Wave calculate EMF? Does it take in um, account for TDD duty cycle? Okay, EMF is really a specialty of my of my colleague, and okay. uh, so we will get back to you on that. Um, okay. We have to take uh, your email and uh, probably uh, explain more by email. Okay. Um, let's see here. Couple more. Whoops. Actually, like what I should have said is that this paper, this this webinar really is a follow-up on the white paper that was co-authored with my colleague Ali Jamali. And when I said my colleague is is uh, knows more about EMF than I do, I was referring to Ali. So yeah, so you, just, yeah. you will hear from Ali Jamali on on EMF. Okay, and we'll uh, maybe send a link to that white paper to everyone who's attended here, uh, so you have the additional information available um, easily. Um, so another question here, would then we look here. Um, how does your accuracy at 3.5 gigahertz for 5G compare to other frequencies of a non-5G network? Right. Okay. So we have published blogs and white papers on that subject. About two years ago, we did measurements at, well, somebody else did measurements for us at millimeter wave frequencies. And then many years ago, we did measurements, I believe, at various shopping malls and hotels for um, at different frequencies at 2.1 gigahertz. And uh, what, what I can say is that the accuracy that we have here at 3.5 using 5G is comparable to what we have seen at lower frequencies using uh, uh, CW measurement equipment uh, or uh, maybe a 3G or 4G, um, you know, KPIs. It also is comparable to what uh, we have had measured for us at millimeter wave band to two years ago so the whole point of this webinar is to point out that our accuracy at 3.5 gigahertz uh using um, 5g is on the same level as what we have seen in the past okay and maybe just one last question here uh before we wrap up uh, we just have a minute left in terms of prediction, uh, what would, is the better KPI? Um, for example, SSRSS, RSRP or SSB RSRP? Any recommendations? Mm, we have we have uh, you have option for both in our tool, so you don't have to choose in between them. You can you mm -hmm. can uh, use either. Um, and for us, really. 
here uh, we were given, you know, SS uh, uh, RSRP. It was not really an option, you know, for me to say I want uh, this or this or another. You know, so yeah. so that well, it's actually no, we were given both. This is not correct. You have seen that on the screen, and we have chosen SS uh, RSRP. I'm not quite sure why we did that, but we have chosen that. Okay, but I'm wondering, what I'm hearing is you should look at both because they're both available. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're available, yeah. Okay, so that takes us um, to the end of the webinar. Apologize to any questions we uh, did not uh, get to today. Uh, we will try to do a follow-up um, for any of the questions we didn't get to. So a big thanks to you, Ladan, for um, joining us to do the webinar and a bigger thanks to everybody in the audience who joined us for today's webinar. A reminder that we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording and we'll add the uh, white paper in there as well with more information for everyone. All right, thank so thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, Kelly. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.